fun, challenging, social, relaxing, a method of escapism. And unless you're a weirdo nerd like me, chances are you don't view UI and UX and apps and platforms with the same kind of lens. In fact, using an app and, or a platform shouldn't be fun, certainly not challenging or social or relaxing escapism. Can you imagine if you had to perfect five QuickTime combo events just to open up messages on your phone? Or a perfect button combo of A, B, A, B, up, down, up, down, just to take a picture? One of my personal favorite gaming memories was playing Borderlands 2 on, surprise, surprise, an Xbox, while I was listening to music via Spotify. I was completely in the zone, destroying bandits and bruisers and psychos, I had the audio of the game toggled so that I could still hear the sound effects and the dialogue, but I was listening to my own music via Spotify on the console. And I know you're asking, wow, Lauren, how is this magic? What is this thing you speak of? Platform, UI, and UX. All of these ecosystems are expanding and overlapping. I can watch Netflix and Hulu and every other social media streaming service on my console and install a game from my mobile to my console, and playing games between PC and console and everything else. So much of a solid gaming experience doesn't just exist within the game itself. All of those micro UX that occurs around the game is just as important. It is critical to understand the sentiment and preference for apps and platforms since so much of gaming UX is not the game itself. Think about all that goes into playing a game that isn't the game. You need to have an account with some service that's logged in to some device that you're going to game on. And it's 2020, so you probably need some kind of network connection. And maybe you also looked at game reviews before you bought it to see who else in your friends group was also playing it and liked it. The game probably needs to be downloaded and maybe updated and then updated again before you even launch it. And what about all that social stuff like messaging and voice chat and everything else? Oh, and then there's the tracking of trophies and achievements and game stats and progress. We talk about platform UX getting out of the way so that we can get to the content, so that we can play the fun games. But what happens when that platform UX isn't great? It's not usable. It isn't clear. Then we notice and we talk about it. And we notice the not so great tends to underestimate how good, good platform UX really is. So how do you know if the UX is good? That's why we're here today to give you some best practices on how to run playtesting on your non-game experiences. I'm Lauren White, and I'm here with Tom LaRusso. We're from the Xbox Research and Design team at Microsoft, and we're excited to present what we've learned in the past few years. Tom is gonna to cover some of the context of how we moved from usability to playtesting in the platform space. Then I'll be back to show you some of the specifics we used on the Xbox dashboard or the homepage. Then like every other talk in the history of all talks ever, we'll wrap it up with some few key learnings. We hope by sharing this process, we can convince you to do more playtest style research on the parts of the gamer experiences that are outside of the game and to look at the end-to-end -end experience holistically. Like Lauren mentioned, the ecosystem around gaming is growing. That's certainly the case for Xbox. We have a suite of apps, we have our consoles, we have accessories, and we have a whole range of web experiences all dedicated to games and gamers and all things that aren't games. So in this case, when we first started playtesting, it really came from our work on the Xbox and one of our most iconic experiences, which is, is the home screen on the Xbox console. So Laura and I have been working in this space for years, but it was mostly usability at the start. Um, we were all about reducing friction for things like starting a game, adding a friend, browsing the store. Uh, but then a few things happened, which gave us this new opportunity. So one, we changed organization so that the platform user research and the games user research all got into one big group called Xbox Research, which is where we are today. 
Uh, we also got a new head of design who came from gaming. So he really wanted to push more modern experiences, but also more modern user research methods. Uh, and at the same time, Microsoft was rolling out a new design language and we were bringing it into Xbox. So for us, it really started with a question that seems kind of simple, which is if everything kind of stays the same, but we change the visuals, what are people going to think about it? So what do we do to tackle that question? Well, first of all, we look to our playtest roots and we thought about how we do this kind of work in games. Uh, and we also looked around the rest of the company because certainly there was lots of other places at Microsoft that were trying to understand people's perceptions of the experience, whether it was the apps we're making, Edge, uh, Windows. Um, there was certainly a bunch of researchers working on it at the time. So we looked at Playtest and we looked what was going on in the rest of the company and we went to work. In this case, the we is myself, Lauren, uh, another researcher named Blake Pellman, and Scott Ososki. So the first thing we had to do was kind of break it down. What is Playtest really about? Um, we broke it down into three things. It's the experience that you're trying to test. It's the constructs or the questions that you want to get information about. And then it's the method, sort of how are you collecting that feedback? Lauren is going to walk through the details of where we ended up, but I can just tell you at a high level, we started with the constructs. Um, Playtest is very much about fun, challenge, pace, gaming. We kind of know what it means. Uh, to a gamer to really enjoy a game experience. But we spent many hours trying to figure out how that applies to a platform. I cannot tell you how many meetings we had where it was, should a platform be fun? Should it be enjoyable? Should it be easy to use? Should it get out of the way? Should you have any emotions around something like a chat app, right? Um, and so we settled on something other than fun, which Lauren's going to talk about later. Um, we actually use an older framework, useful, usable, and desirable. So when we talk about the constructs we ended up with, they kind of fit loosely into those buckets. We also had to think about the experience. What is a non-game experience and what level do we want to test at? We kept it at kind of like an app or an operating system level. So the Xbox dashboard, our family app. Um, we didn't go so specific into like a friends list or a small feature because that didn't feel like a big enough experience to really get that kind of feedback on. So I think there's some flexibility there, but for us, we wanted to kind of keep the experiences big enough that we could get the most bang out of the buck when we're testing. So then the method, we know games are more or less self-driven. You open up the game, it kind of tells you what it wants to do. Playtest is great about testing the first few hours of a game. For a platform, you could open up an Xbox and just watch Netflix for an hour. That's really not gonna tell us anything about the UX. You could get into a chat app and have a 20 minute conversation with someone without seeing any of the other features that that app might offer. So we had to sit down and have some really good solid thinking about how we wanted to define what we'd even go play test in the first place. And lots of great discussion around, do we tell people what to do? Should it feel like a usability study? Should it be free flowing? Um, we actually had multiple iterations of this over the last couple of years, and we think we've settled in a really good spot, which Lauren is going to tell you about right now. Since game playtesting was already a well-established engine, much of the early work on platform playtesting started from those constructs of useful, usable, and desirable. We quickly realized that there were several dimensions from games that did not apply to app or platform playtests, things like pacing, difficulty, and story. The Beyond Fun research questions, and there were 177 of those, we actually narrowed down to 28 that were applicable for apps and platforms. And this is where we landed with the current set. The questions revolved around those three constructs, useful, usable, and desirable, based on some fancy component statistical analyses. The first thing you'll notice is that we have a top-level construct of satisfaction. As Tom mentioned, we spent many hours of discussion and survey validation around this one point. We looked at as many possibilities, but the most valid ended up being satisfaction. Not only did it make the most sense to users, but it turned out to be a good proxy for the rest of the constructs that you see here. Just like fun works for games, it seems like satisfaction works for platforms and apps. And as a fun side note, we're also moving away from NPS, that's the Net Promoter Score, in Xbox and moving more towards satisfaction. You can also see that we broke up useful into two different questions, useful to me and useful to other people. Through survey validation, we found some users answer the question for themselves 
and others would answer it more generally for the public or their friends and family. With these two questions, we could let them give us feedback for each, and we feel more confident in the data. With these 28 questions, we included the SUS questions, or the System Usability Scale. The SUS questions included things like complexity, integration, confidence, and inconsistency. We included these because they capture the sentiment and tensions that can exist around apps and platforms. The SUS also allows us to give us the experience a rough grade based on other products tested or the general guidelines in the public. We could finish a playtest and show the scores, but then also say the usability of this got a D and we really need to make some changes. If you're working with stakeholders in games, you know they love grades and scores and numbers. So the more that we can quantify things, the better. Desirability is the last category and one of the most important. So first off, let's look at fast or speed or performance. This is one of the single most important constructs for a platform. Much like the graphics for big AAA games, users expect speed out of a platform. They think it's just pressing some buttons and changing the screen and almost have no tolerance for lag. So if you're ever trying to measure the perception of an experience, you have to include something around speed and performance and input or something like that. And as you can see here, we literally just straight up asked participants how desirable it is. Again, after many surveys and deep analysis, this was the best way to get at the construct around desirability. We have a solid set of questions. So now what? When do you do this type of testing? So we tried to test these experiences as close as the app or platform is to releasing. And that's for two reasons. One, for the stability of the experience, just to make sure that things are baked as possible. And two, so that we can recruit participants that haven't had a chance to use it on their own. So under non-pandemic circumstances, we would bring participants into the lab and instruct them to use the app or platform as they normally would for about 30 minutes. The goal is to have a good understanding of how this works. That is the phrase we literally tell participants. The duration of the study is also important. A nice balance between making sure that participants are not using the app or platform too short so that they don't have a good idea of how it works, but also not too long so that they get really bored and don't know what else to do. So after doing a few trials of this approach, we quickly realized that participants should not be given a set of predetermined tasks to complete. The emphasis is for them to really use the app or platform as they normally would, however they would normally use it in their real life, and not derail them by making them use a set of structured tasks that they have to go through one by one by one. So I can hear your remote video cries who are these participants, Lauren? Please tell me. For platform benchmarks, we made it a case to find novices, people who have little to no familiarity with the app or platform itself. So if we're doing an Xbox benchmark, for example, we would do our best to not recruit current Xbox customers. Participants are precious, so we would often conduct other research that wasn't related to the benchmark itself. However, we would only do one app or playtest benchmark in a single session with any extra piggyback research happening after that core benchmark portion. One of the primary purposes of conducting benchmark studies is for comparison's sake. With all the questions that we ask during these sessions, the visuals can get overwhelming with all the graphs and all the charts so when we start talking about comparisons to previous versions or other related apps or platform experiences, looking at the scores in isolation can be a little disheartening. Since games are generally supposed to be fun and enjoyable experiences, it is not crazy to see a game benchmark have scores that are hovering in the 4.2 to 4.7 range. But when you look at an app or a platform benchmark and those scores, 
hitting that kind of positive range is really, really difficult. Just because of the very nature of these apps and platforms that we're testing, they tend to be more utility oriented. So instead, we need to lean on comparison data to help us understand how these experiences are landing. So to know if a certain dimension is improving between a different build or an iteration or a version, looking at a 3.2 in a vacuum is not as valuable as comparing that 3.2 from version one to a 3.6 from version two. And now I'll hand it back over to Tom. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so that was a little bit about the process and then where we landed. Hopefully you find that useful. Just to quickly review, um, I think the key takeaways for this talk are there's a lot of power in adapting your playtest to non-gaming experiences. There's so much that a gamer interacts with right now that is not a game. We want to make sure that we not only have the usability, we have the usefulness, and we do have that desirability. Uh, and the best way to do that is to test through playtesting. In terms of the constructs, we lead with satisfaction. We've proven it over the last couple of years to be a really good indicator. Uh, it's also becoming more and more of an industry standard. It, it has that same kind of feeling that fun has in games, uh, but can be used in a wide variety of experiences. So another point is that by building out the playtest, you can start in the lab, but then you can move out into the wild and you can scale up from 30 people to 3,000 to 30,000 uh, to get some great quantitative feedback once your product is out in the world. So now I want to leave you with a concrete example. This is the most recent visual refresh that we did on the Xbox dashboard. Uh, the updates here were based on years of research, but also years of iteration uh, and using the constructs and our playtest data to help refine and tweak the visuals. We wanted to make sure things look great. We wanted to make sure things didn't distract or cause anybody usability issues. Um, but really, we wanted to answer that question that we answered a few years back, which is, how do we change things so people enjoy it better? How is it more delightful? How is it more satisfying? Uh, and how are they just going to give us great feedback about the changes we're making? So thanks for listening. Hope you learned something. Hope it's useful. And we hope you can take the information here and go start playtesting your non-game experiences. Thanks a lot. Oh, 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 oh,